Welcome into another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. We got a fun episode lined up today. I have a guest with me, and we're going to talk about the secret formula to winning. That's a cool topic. I was intrigued when I first heard about it, uh, and I know you will too. We got to know each other a little bit behind the scenes here just a few minutes ago, and I'm just super excited to dive in. But before we get there, let's talk about Harmonious. What is this show? Why are you here? What are you listening to, you crazy person out there? Harmonious is the 10 fundamental business disciplines that you need to not only know, but master in order to thrive and scale your business. But we also on this show talk a lot about mind and body. It's the three-legged stool of business, right? Business, mind, and body. We're going to touch on all aspects today, I'm sure, and definitely within the Harmonious acronym. So let me welcome on my guest, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, I'm excited to dive in. So before we get there, before we talk about the secret formula to winning, um, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, no problem. So right now, what I'm doing is uh, what I'd like to call performance coaching of executives. And one of the things, so just to give you some backstory, I grew up in a motorsports family. So I've been racing for 40 years. I've been a professional race car driver, racing anything from, I started out in motorcycles and then go-karts, moved over to Europe, uh, actually specifically England. I moved to England whenever I was 18, actually graduated high school early, moved over there. And and a lot of people are like, well, why, why in the world did you go to England? I mean, and they're racing here in the US. Well, England is, it's like Hollywood for professional race car drivers. So if anybody who's serious about becoming a professional race car driver, as soon as you can get your car racing license, whether you're from Brazil, Japan, South America, doesn't Australia, doesn't matter. They all go to England and they all live around Silverstone, which is the track that F1 race is at. So I did that. I was actually invited to drive for the American team at the Formula Ford Festival, the Team Green Academy picked me as one of the top 25 young drivers under the age of 25. They took us out to Vegas. We were evaluated. This is uh, team green was an IndyCar team. I've run my own team. I've done stock cars. I've raced sports cars, done all that. And the way I got into this performance coaching is I signed to drive for an infinity team in a sports car series, the highest level sports car series in the United States. And while the car was being built, I, you know, I live in Dallas, Fort Worth area. I decide, Hey, I'm going to go and meet all the infinity dealerships because you never know as a driver, you could be doing merchandise. You, 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 there's all kinds of things you could do if you're racing for a manufacturer. So I met all of them and I met with George Grubbs and we just hit it off. And he had one dealership, an infinity dealership out of, in Euless, Texas. And we just sort of, became friends. We would do some things out at the racetrack with his customers. And that was kind of it for a long time. And then in 2012, George was looking to get more dealerships and he was in the process of raising capital. And one day we were just friends and we just went to lunch and I, we were talking about what he was doing and everything. And ultimately I just, and keep in mind, I know nothing about dealerships. I don't know how they work. I don't know the situation. And I just asked him, I said, Hey, don't you guys keep track of where you guys stand as far as the rankings of other dealerships? And he was like, Oh yeah, totally. I said, well, where do you stand? And he goes, well, we're 33rd out of 200 infinity dealerships. And I turned to him and I was like, well, then you need to stop this whole raising capital thing. And he was like, what are you talking about? And I go, nobody's going to invest millions and millions of dollars in the guy who's in 33rd. You need to go win. And it, and I told him, I said, look, in all of my racing, whether it was local motorcycles, local go-karts, or at an international level, once you start winning, opportunities come that you can't even imagine. So you need to just go win. And of course, he thought I was crazy. But he was also crazy enough to hire me as his performance coach. And we went out and, and took the steps. And as I've been doing this with George, we actually took, we took, I took the dealership from 33rd to number one, took us four years to do it. And what I found through this whole thing, and then also through my racing experience and also observing other people within racing, outside of racing, I boiled down what it takes to win to just three 
core components that you have to have. You have yeah. to have you have to have the skills, you have to have the will, and you have to have the means, and you have to have them all one hundred percent. You can't have fifty and one, seventy and a hundred percent. Yeah, I think this is a first of all, that is a very racing mentality that you need to go win first, and no one's <laughs> going to invest in thirty third. But ultimately, it's true. Um, I, I actually I am a racing fan. I'm I lean more NASCAR. Um, sorry, I'm very American, right? But I'm I'm familiar with other series. But what you're saying is very true. If you look at any motorsports level oh, level of motorsports, um, you you see consistently that the teams that win the most have the biggest budgets. And you say, why is that? Well, they have the the most number of sponsors wanting to come on board and get their name seen with a winner. People love to associate with winners. So yeah, it's a motorsports theory and ideology but it shows up in in business too and i love that you you have this formula so i want to dive in you have the three pieces how do you how do you work with people to develop all three how do you identify them like what's what's the start of working with people to be ultimately a winner yeah i mean some of it's just getting in just you just have to dive in and just find out where they're at and i think you're going what you're going to find is it really is that simple that there is three things that you're, you're going to have to have. And I, and I can tell you what I did with George. So it wasn't, it wasn't difficult for me to find out real quickly that he had the skills. I mean, he had plenty of skills. That was not a problem. He had the means. So he had all the resources it, it took to be able to make the decision where he lacked was the will. Hmm. And I would, and when I say the will, I'm not talking about the will to run a very successful business. I mean, he, he had that no problem. Keep in mind, he's four generations. His family's been in the business for 75 years. He had everything in place. But his, when you looked at the, the team, at the, the overall company that he had, I looked at it this way. He needed to change the culture of the, his whole business from, a good company to a winning team. Mm. And to do that, he needed to just com completely come about this a different way. And when I would, I would just walk into the store, into the dealership. And it wasn't as if I, I didn't even have to go and interview everybody or go to that. You could just tell, I just walked in there and I said, look, this is just a nine to five or mentality. This is nine to five because I know what winning teams look like. And I told him that just straight up. I said, okay, if you, and whenever I said you need to go win, it took me, I said, look, I'm going to go away. I'll come back. And it was like, it was literally could have been six months later. I came back to him and I said, okay, now I know what you need to do to win. And we're going to, if you just implement all this, you'll win. Now it's going to, and I said, it's going to take probably three, four years to do it. It ended up taking four, but I knew it would work. And so we did. So obviously everyone wants to know how, how in the world did you do this? Okay. So, so I'm going to tell you how I did it to help give you a roadmap for your success. So we did three things to get the will to raise the will. First thing is we had a clear mission. We just said, we're going to become the number one Infinity dealership in the country. And I explained to George, look, you are the leader of this team. This, this only works at the leader level. Nobody else can do it. Nobody else can rah, rah, rah. It has to be the leader. You have to just start going around to everybody and saying, we're going to be the number one infinity dealership in the country. And you constantly say that you just do it. The other thing I, so every communication, every thought and every action had to align with that mission. The next thing that we did is I did a thing called a visualization tool with them. So I took the infinity performance sheets that come out every month and I took George from the middle and I photoshopped them up at the top. <laughs> I gave him that piece of paper and I said, okay, that's where we're going. Now I want you to feel that. And I want you to see yourself as the number one infinity dealership in the country. I know how powerful that is because anytime I would finish like a practice session or qualifying or whatever, when you see your name at the top, it just energizes you. Even if it's fake, it's still, you're like, okay, I see where you're going. We're going to go there. It's, it may sound crazy, but it, it does work. 
The other thing is, and this is probably the most important thing of all of it. You can't do those other things. They don't matter unless you do this. It's committed action. So as a leader, you have to be insanely committed to win. You constantly are asking your team, what do you need for us to win? Basically, what I would say is just go to every person, your general managers, and you say, we're going to be the number one infinity dealership in the country. What do you need from us to win? And if they say, well, you know, I need this special software to, to make it happen. Okay, go get it. Not, oh, we're going to evaluate it. We're going to run a committee on this thing. No, you said that's the best thing. You need that for us to win. I'm going to get that for you right now. Then you come back after a couple months and you say, hey, you got that new program. The whole thing's working. How's it going for you? And he goes, you know, it's actually, I need three people. Now, I realize I need th to hire three more people to run this thing correctly. Okay, go get them. And then you go get it. And then you come back after a little while and you come back to them and you say, okay, you need it. You, I got you that. I got you the three people you needed. What else do you need? And they say, you know, I, now that I've been running this thing for this whole time, I need a whole nother program. This one's not good enough. We need to scrap this and start over. Okay, go get it. After you've done this, multiple times. Now you've put all the ownership on those managers. They have to perform. And when you come back to them and they aren't getting better, now you're saying, look, I've given you everything you needed. Are you really going to be the number one infinity general manager of this store? Are you really that good? And then they have to, then it's on them. It's not like, Hey, I have to get somebody in here because I need the best person for this job. When you think of it in racing terms, I need the best person to change the tire on the left front and the right front and the left. I don't care about anything else. That's what I'm worried about. That's how you win. So once you realize that it just takes that high level of commitment and that you have to, you have to show that to your team that you're going to do it. Because only the team owner can do this. And I always say, look, think of it this way. Just to give you an example, if I sign to drive for a team and the team owner hesitates to go testing, to go improve the car, mm -hmm. it breaks the spirit of the team. Because we know the team owner is no longer serious about winning. He can talk all he wants. But if he's not backing it up with a committed action, you know it's fake. Because we know a real team owner is going to say, okay, you wanted one day of testing. No, 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 no. We're going to go do four days of testing. And if you need more days of testing, we're going to do it. We're going to win this championship, period. That fires a team up to say, oh my gosh, we're really going to do it. So as a leader, you have to realize that you there's only two things that you can possibly do for your team. You're either lifting their spirits up to win or you're breaking them. There is no middle ground. And that's the thing that most people miss is they don't realize that, yes, you could run a very successful business doing committees, doing, you know, you know, cost analysis, doing all this stuff, but you're not going to win because the winners are just going to say, look, it's more important for me to make a move and try it and fail than it is for me to waste the time to do all this studies and all this stuff. So it's just a different thought process that, that you have to have whenever you're going to go out there to say, I'm not, not middle ground. I'm going to win. I'm going to literally be the best one there is. Yeah. I, I love that outlook and it's, it's so true. And you actually hit on something that's, that's important to us at what if, and we always start there because we see how important it is. So in the harmonious acronym above my head here, if you're watching, um, if you're listening, you can hear where the N is. It's right in the middle, but that's where we start. The N means navigate. And for a company, you and Jeff said it, you have to establish, and the leader is really the only one that can do this, you have to establish the mission and the vision. The vision is the five-year where are we going to be? What is the goal that we're chasing? And the mission is how do we show up on a daily basis? What's the injustice we're fighting in the world? And the team has to rally behind that. And the things that start to touch it are the I and the H. So you're inspire. That's your leadership to inspire your people to go and chase and fight that vision. 
And that's where corporate America gets it wrong because you just have people showing up to do their nine to five jobs, much like you said was happening at the dealership. They don't care where the company's going. They just care that they're getting a paycheck. And ultimately that shows in the culture, in the will, as you said. So I, I love that you have, you've identified that process, but I can't even tell you how many people, small businesses, big businesses, and everything in between miss that step and get it wrong. And that's why they have a team of people who just really don't care. But when you have a team of winners, you have a winning culture. That's where I would, I would assume, and you could tell me the means start to come, right? Cause as winning comes, the money comes in the support, everything is that, where, is that where you go next? Yeah. So, I mean, that was actually one of the things that I really had to, was difficult. And this is going to be difficult for, I mean, the stuff I'm talking about is not the stuff for somebody who's starting. Like right. it's not a startup. Yep. It's not somebody who's the type of people that I would be talking with and working with are people that they do have a good business. It, it, it's, it's a solid business, but they're ready to just go to the next level. And they're like, I really want to win. And like I said, when I told George, once you, one of the things that I made very clear from, from the beginning is you can't have two goals when it becomes, when you're want to win, yeah. you can't have two goals. And the two goals you can't have is I want profit and I want to win. You can't, you can't do that. You have to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win. And because I won, that's what will get me to the next level. That's the, and that right there is extremely difficult, which is why there's very few people who can actually make the commitment to go in is they have to be willing to say, look, I know this is going to cost me a fortune, but I'm making the investment for the future that you really don't know what's going to happen. So let me tell you what happened for us. So we started this project in 2012. By 2015, the culture was changing at the dealership. We were going up the ranks and we finally won our first month, which was a big deal. We took it, I mean, which is huge. His dealership had never done that. They've been around since 1989. This is the first time they went. So you can win a month and then you win the overall year. So I, I looked at it this way. Every month was like a race and then the overall was a championship. That's the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. So we won our, our first month. And we took the entire team out to a steak dinner and I had a custom trophy made. Nobody knew it that I made this. So I thought it was going to be awesome and celebrate the whole thing. At the end, it was just basically me and George who got our pictures taken with this thing. They didn't know what to think of it. So, But we finished 2015. So we went from 33rd in 2012. With 2015, we finished the full year in third place. And I told George at the time, I said, look, third place is great. But let me tell you the harsh truth here. Third place is only halfway. It gets super steep now because now you're dealing with all the people that are going to do whatever it takes to win. So then 2016 came. And by this time, now the whole entire culture at the dealership had changed. Everybody was united to go win. They were all working together. It was a completely different atmosphere there. Everybody was, you're now, everybody's talking about it. Like, oh my gosh, we're winning. Oh, how we do this month? Everyone wants to know, oh my gosh, the, you know, there was a, a dealership out of New York that we were battling with all year long. It just went back and forth and it would be like, oh, they won this month. Dang it. You know, like it's that kind of thought process. Not, nobody knew where they even finished years ago. They didn't even care. And we gave, we went into the last month. We were in second place. So going into December. We had to, for us to win, we'd have to set an all-time sales record for Infinity they'd ever done and hope he didn't do better. <laughs> now, this is where the commitment came. George was like, we're going to win this thing now. I'm going to do whatever it takes. It cost, I don't even want to say the exact number, but let's just say it's a fortune, a fortune. We basically, you call it buying the business, which means... When somebody comes in and they're going to buy a car, we're going to sell it no matter what the loss is. <laughs> we're going to sell this car. So we took a huge, huge amount of money that it costs to, to win December. We won December and we won the overall year. So after, and so not only did we sell, we, we did sell the most in the United States, but we sold more than any infinity dealership 
in the world. It was wow. incredible. Yes. So, of course, now your question, which is, you know, what happens once you start winning? What actually happened to us? Well, from the time we won, George has gone from one dealership to seven. He's been awarded a brand new dealership from Acura and awarded a brand new dealership from Volvo. And we purchased a couple dealerships. Now, when I say they award it, you have to understand you can't purchase a new dealership. It's impossible. They It goes through a huge process where the manufacturers, they get hundreds of applications from every dealer there is. Mm -hmm. You can't buy it. And we could never have won a bidding war anyways because there's publicly traded dealership groups out there that have hundreds of dealerships. You've got Penske, which has 300 dealerships. We had one dealership. I mean, and we still beat them to get these new dealerships. So that's what I'm talking about. So, and before, before we, he, we won, he would, we would try to get new dealerships. You know, we would be one of the hundreds that would be in the bidding. And we remember we got into the top three for one in the Dallas area for an, a Nissan dealership. And of course we didn't get it. And now looking back in retrospect, we knew that, that we would never have got it. They just laughed at us. They were <laughs> laughing at us. We were just, we were just filling their quota basically that they had to look at so many to, to be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because once we won, the manufacturers started contacting us and we started hearing what really happens to get dealerships. Mm. And we were like, oh, okay, now we know. And that's, and that's the thing is as soon as you start winning, I mean, my gosh, now it, it's just a, it's not only is it the fact that you now know what it takes, yep. but you, everybody else who knows what it takes, they now go, okay, you're somebody I want to work with. Now I want to invest in you. And it was, and it was funny because I asked George, I said, Hey, I tell you what, after we won, we were just sort of hanging out one time and I just said, Hey, now that you know what it really takes to win, how hard it is, the commitment level you have to have to do this. How much are you going to invest in the number 33rd guy? Zero. Nothing. Because he knows you yeah. would somebody once you get to that level that you know how hard it is to win, no matter what you're doing, you would rather invest in somebody who tried extremely hard and failed dramatically. Than someone who's just a middle of the road running a nine to five company, they're kind of scraping by, they're doing okay. I mean, eat, and, and, and okay could be you're making millions and millions of dollars. You know, you have a great business, but you're just not pushing the limits of what you could do. And it's so obvious whenever you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this is this is a great conversation, especially around leadership and running a business. And there's well, I think a lot of times in business we don't think about the aspect of, of winning necessarily, because there is no scoreboard. And in a lot of cases, obviously that's, that one's different where they do publish monthly numbers and reports and franchise systems and big companies do have that kind of stuff. But as small business owners, you know, we don't, we don't have this, we don't know where our competition stands, but when you look at your life and your business, and then you compare it to athletes like, uh, like Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan, like these guys are, we've all heard of and, they're the greatest that have ever lived at their their sport you look how hard they work and you like jeff said are you going to work that hard like are you are you going to do that for your business and when you make that mental shift and the commitment to actually go and chase that that goal and that vision for yourself and your business it's it's a different world and it takes a whole new level of commitment um Jeff, I think this is a fantastic conversation. I want to uh, I want to put your website on the screen here for people who want to take that next step and work with you. Can you tell us a little bit about where where we can find you, get in touch, and actually take that next step to elevate our performance? Yeah, I mean the best place is jeffharrison.com. And if somebody's looking to, I mean, I right now I've been going out and doing speeches on this to other business groups to try to help people understand some of these. I'm also consulting with people if they want to try to take it to the next level and just explain to that, just literally just explaining that this is what it really takes is eye opening for most people. Yeah. Because they just don't know it. I mean, 
I think like you talked about the sports figures and stuff, and those are great examples to see every time you watch any sports, no matter what it is, I mean, you're seeing excellence. I mean, it's, it is excellence and they make it look so easy, which is the whole point. That's why they're so good. I mean, I'm sure everybody, uh, uh, car racing is probably the worst because everybody drives a car and yeah. literally everybody in the stands thinks they can go do it. <laughs> they all, but nobody is like, oh yeah, just give me the basketball. I'll go out there against LeBron James. I got mm-hmm. this. No, it's just that difficult in cars. Trust me. And yeah, when when people are ready to just see what it really takes, look at look over their whole program. It's good. It's it's eye opening. I think for most people, I, I really do think it's eye opening, and and it's it's been fun for me because I've dealt with a lot of guys who are very successful in business. They get into car racing, and the way they apply these these principles, the skill, the will, the means, is really it's really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Because you got these guys who they they could be the greatest. Uh, like one guy I knew, he had a mutual fund, sold it, started racing cars when he was in his fifties, and he had, without doubt, he had the means, and he had the the will, and he was out there at a. I was I worked at a, I, I was a club pro at a country club racetrack back when I was in my twenties. And he would be there every week, every day they were open on the track, running over and over and over again. And he did that for years and I would coach him some. And then he also, he stepped it up and just did more and more and more. And then ultimately he won the national championship at a amateur level and went pro racing. It, it was, and then once he get went into pro racing, he realized, cause he was teammates with, uh, it was two driver teams, sports car racing. And when he realized that he was the weak weak link of the racing team, like they'd be up at the front, he gets in, they move to the back. When he realized, okay, I'm good at an amateur level, but I can't run with the pros. He got out of the car and put someone in so they would win. And they won two championships. Yeah. I mean, it's the realization that, hey, and that's a good thing for team, for, for, for people who own companies as well. Hey, yes, you maybe took the, the company from zero to, you know, say 10, whatever the number is, you, you brought it up that high, but maybe you aren't the right, you don't have the skills to take it to the next level, but you can still win if you put someone in there that has those, the different skills that you don't have. So, I mean, that's, so when I say the skills, it's, it's, it's from an overall organizational thought process, not just a one individual person thought process. Yeah, it's a great message. And I, I remember just this just popped in my head. I had a mentor many years ago and he he had this phrase that he would say over and over and over again. And it definitely changed the way I look at business. And it was simple. It's two words. Winners win. <laughs> I think that's that's the moral of the story here. It doesn't matter if you're if you're the quarterback, the the lead driver, the business owner. If you're if you're a winner, you'll find a way to win. It doesn't and it's not ego driven. It's not if you're leading the team, it's you will find the pieces and put them in place. And you'll get it done, like Jeff's saying. So, um, Jeff, I, I appreciate you coming in and sharing your your formula for winning and success. And I hope this was eye opening for you listening or watching wherever you are, because he's right. If you if you say you want to win, just be careful what you're committing yourself to, and make sure you actually want that, because it's going to require a lot of work. Um, whether it's business, sports, life, whatever it is, this was a cool conversation. I appreciate you coming on. Um, for those of you watching, listening, wherever you are, make sure you hit the subscribe button. I don't know if I want to win and be the best podcast in the world, but I definitely want to put out the best information possible and make sure that you do not waste a second listening to the show. We talked on a number of the different disciplines in the harmonious architecture and also a lot in the mind and body. You have to make, make the mindset change that says you are going to be a winner, whatever it takes, elevate your leadership, elevate your people, elevate your company as a whole, and you'll get there. So thank you for tuning in to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. I will see you on the next one.